to one. Okay, welcome back to part three of our conversation. Um, right, so um, yeah, um, going through Dave's examples like the school, um, I mean, I, I get frustrated by the libertarians who kind of defend the heroin going into the, the school. Although to defend them slightly, I do understand what they're saying because they're basically making the point, look, it's not owned property, you know, it's not legitimately owned. And even if it was owned by the citizenry, they'd all be equal owners. So therefore the heroin addict has as much standard. I, I get where they're coming from. But the thing that frustrates me with that is they're missing the more pertinent argument. Because even if we say, even if we go with Dave and say, well, yeah, let's treat it like it's private property, because obviously in a free society, that's what it would end up being. A school would end up being a private property, whether, you know, um, one way or another, even if it stayed quote unquote public that was collectively owned by local citizens or residents or whatever for that purpose it would be privately owned by a collective of people or whatever so you know it would be like you say public property is a bit of a misnomer because it's it's not valid um uh, particularly as government but public could the, the, the public however you want to kind of cl classify them or citizens or whatever local residents they could all collectively pay for a a, a school that was open to the public but as you say it would be private property and it would you know you could apply whatever rules you wanted to keep the heroin addicts out or the pedophiles or just general people who don't belong in the school um so i'm quite happy to go with with dave on that that thing but like you mentioned it doesn't scale up to a country and it doesn't scale up to a country for a very important reason like yes okay let's say we apply the school as if it was a private problem and treat it as if it was private that's fine yeah we can keep the heroin addicts out we can you know operate it exactly as we would if it was privately owned but we can't do that with a country because the country isn't privately owned and it could never be privately owned like uh, a country itself is not property it's just a geographical region within which there is a lot of privately owned property that's owned by different people plus there's obviously a lot of areas that aren't owned and I don't mean when I say aren't owned I don't mean like things that are currently like government owned but would otherwise be privately owned like schools and libraries and even parks or roads I'm talking about unowned area like as in not been homesteaded as in you know all the natural areas the grasslands the forests the lakes and all the rest of it i mean government still claims some level of ownership over that but in a free society unless someone's actually homesteaded it and applied a valid reason why they've got some kind of property ownership there they it wouldn't be anybody's property and the thing is is the reason and that's why the school thing doesn't doesn't scale up to me because it's not the same thing it's not just about the size of it the nature of it is totally different the, the, you know you the reason why you can defend the school borders perfectly well is because essentially it would be a property and you can treat it like a private property and that's fine just the same as you can defend your house and everything else but your nation you're falling into that same problem again where by defending those borders you're not just defending your private property but you're preventing people from going other places so that's why right. i think yeah. yeah. And and I would agree. Like that's where I think Dave's argument needs fleshed out more if he wants to, to continue to try to make the case. Like I'm I'm sympathetic to what he's saying. I'm sympathetic that there's an obvious negative consequence to doing nothing about what's going on at the borders. And I understand the desire to want to try to find an answer that fits roughly within libertarianism, allows people some kind of response to mitigate the immediate danger and that could also work towards you know some kind of like you know advancement of liberty overall um I, that's why i typically offer the decentralization route along with some kind of like sponsorship system I, I, even those are not like I think I think what I'm suggesting is a bit more realistic than the bring all the troops in and put them on the border thing. Um, although mine's still not like an immediate like that's going to happen tomorrow um, kind of thing. Um, you know, I, I think Dave's the, the one point that Dave says that I, I will agree with is that when people are trying to say that the position the libertarian should take is necessarily that we must just make the border entirely open. I am not convinced that that is – I mean, first of all, some people just try to define open borders as just uh, the default libertarian position because it's the government not doing anything. And it's just like – no, it, that's – to me, that's just very misleading 
that's not what most people mean by open borders. They don't mean just the removal of government. Um, you know, and, and open borders functionally is not just the removal of government influence. Because as long as the government exists, even if it didn't have the welfare state, even if it didn't have those externalities, if the government exists and creates the artificial, you know, boundary of like this is our country and therefore we have our laws, it's still going to create a tragedy of the commons uh, over the area it governs. And so that border and, and the intrusion of the state into that into the world is a distortion of free markets. And so it's still not open borders is not a it's still a statist policy. Now, you can make the argument, and I often used to do this. I used to make the argument that open borders is a statist policy, but it is the one that involves the least amount of violations of rights and the least growth of government power. But it's a matter of trade-offs. And five years ago, you know, even two years ago, I was still more or less convinced that that was true and that the trade-offs were still on the open borders side. I am I am no longer convinced of that. That doesn't mean I'm completely convinced in the opposite direction. And I'm like, you know, we need to, you know, rush like, you know, and, 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 and that's, I'm very cautious. And what I agreed with something you said is we have to be careful to not be driven too much by fear or like, uh, expediency. Cause yeah, that can, that can, and, and we can't perfectly predict any of, you know, the consequences of any course of action we do. So we do need to be cautious with what we do and not act too much motivated out of fear, you know, but you can't have a time preference of zero because then it's like, you know, th that's also an error. It's like, so you can have a, a, a time preference that's insanely too high and that leads to bad decisions. And you can have a time preference that's so low that you, you know, while you're sitting there, you know, thinking about all the different ways you could act, you, you know, you get hit by a car because of inaction. So there, there's, there is sort of a damned if you do, damned if you don't sort of, uh, um, conundrum that we're, we're faced with. And, and so, but, but I think what would help is if more people were taking your approach because you're at least willing to concede the same way I did when I talked to Dave, the baseline of his argument in terms of the micro level dealing of public property. And, and I am interested in seeing what are the ways we can scale that up in ways that we can maybe come up with more creative solutions. So I'm not even convinced mine's the best possible. It's just the best I've come up with, come up with so far, because as you said, not all property uh, in, in America is one collective public property, right? It's a collection of different types of properties. Some aren't even properties at all. It's just unopened space. I mean, it's completely unhomesteaded open space that the state's like, this is mine, or the state is sold off to giant, you know, corporations and banks and foreign uh, NGOs that are like, this is mine. It's like, not really, not by libertarian norms. It's so that's, that's definitely a problem. Um, and, and so it, it doesn't quite scale up for, for that, for, for, that reason alone. I mean, one one other thing I've thought of is that we should actually be encouraging the as much as possible for all that space to be homesteaded and become private property. Um, but 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 that's you know unfortunately tough. The incentives are against us there. Um, but if if this conversation was being had with people like Dave and the movement's reaction was by and large, yes, we agree on the micro level. Let's keep pursuing better solutions on the macro level. That'd be different. But when people are coming at Dave with this, like, no, like, let you know, the homeless pedophile drug user has a right to, to be in the classroom with the kids. It's like we've we have departed from virtue and reality at, at, at that point and are no longer able to have productive conversations. So I, I think that's part of the problem with the with the debate is that some people are. Uh, digging their heels in the sand on just just really bad bad arguments and and it, it's prompted me to say a few times and and Matthew Bellis my my co-host on that episode as we mentioned in the first segment of this conversation he, he um he had a point in that episode where he said there needs to be kind of a do no harm ethos that runs through what we're talking about as libertarians and if at any point you're saying that our abstract principles have to be weighted higher than immediate harm that's being uh you know put upon somebody 
you might be on the losing side of of a of an argument, right? It's like because I, I as much as I, I I do care about private property rights, I do care about uh consistency, I care about these principles a lot. Um but two things. Ultimately, I think what the reason why we care about those things is because we care about peace. We care about uh, voluntary interactions and about people not being harmed. So if we're if we're saying we're advocating for our principles, but they're leading to harm, then I feel like we're not either either we've made an error or I think this is my second thing. I think the problem is, as I said earlier, there is no perfect way to apply our principles in a area that they were never meant to be used. It's kind of like if if you were uh, trying to think of a good example here, um, what, what comes to mind is like uh, video games, right? So if, if you were like trying to play a video game that was designed for a certain controller and then somehow like someone like spliced in a controller from a completely different system, that didn't have all the correct buttons and and they and the things didn't interface right like you wouldn't be able to play that game and and so trying to use natural law libertarian principles in the world of the commons in the worlds of public property which is like this fictitious reality the state has created it 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 doesn't always go the way we want now what you said is i'm wary about playing these status games believe me brother i am too <laughs> and 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 we all are but I feel like some of us have just gotten to the point where it's like, you know what, we have we have as a movement existed now for long enough that we've been talking about these ideas. And just educating people alone doesn't seem to be getting the ball rolling en enough. We need to get out there into the public square, so to speak, and get into uh, the Overton window of policy making and be at least putting our ideas out there more and be trying to advocate for harm reduction while you know, we wait for this multi-generational change to, to to happen, in my opinion. And so um, and so that's why I think that the, the problem is not that the principles are wrong. It's just the principles aren't meant to be used in this fictitious spa space that the state has created. Now, you have two options, right? If you don't want to engage in the statist space, by all means, I'm not saying you have to. And I'm not even saying that people like Dave or people like myself are doing so perfectly. And and so we kind of are going to have to depend upon each other. I actually, I had a post like a week ago where I said, you know, even the people I disagree with, I appreciate them holding our, you know, in a, you know, figurative sense, our, our, our feet to the fire in an intellectual way. We need to be pushed to be make sure that, uh, you know, that, that we're not abandoning our principles, that we're not, distorting libertarianism uh, but then i would say the challenge in the other direction is we need to understand how to apply our principles in the real world in a way that doesn't lead to destructive outcomes and be like we we don't want to get people to, to give people the wrong idea of what we're advocating for we don't want people to think that we don't care about their problems we don't want think people to think that it's like i don't care about all the ways in which you're being harmed my abstract principles tell me that you just have to roll over and accept that like that's not a winning message. We need to show people how much we care. We need to show, and then we need to talk to people about here's the ideal solution, and then come up with, you know, the the you know the second best, the third best, whatever we can do in the interim, in, in terms of trying to find those principled compromises. And then, like I said before, I think it's going to be peaks and valleys. We're not going to always get it perfect. Um, I I just think that rather than it's it's sort of like in sports, right? Um, so like I'm in America, we have football, so that's what I what I use. But I think if any sport's going to have that, like whether it's soccer, whether it's football, or whether it's your football or my football, uh, <laughs> whether, it's anything, whether it's basketball, like you miss 100 percent of the shots you don't take, right? So we're going to make mistakes as we're playing the game, but I would rather play the game. And and just take them, take the mistakes, take the hits on the chin that we, that we have to, but then keep chipping away at it, then be like, you know, I mean, I don't know how to do this, like, you know, it's like, the, you know, and it, look, not everyone's equipped for that, but I think guys like Dave are, as you admitted to, a net positive for the movement, and even if he doesn't hit it out of the park one hundred percent of the time, he's our biggest home run hitter who gets on the biggest platforms, and I, I'm going to give him some leeway even when I don't completely agree with him to, to think he's still going to be a net benefit for, for our team and, and that I want him out there 
uh, you know, in the, you know, with the game on the line with 30 seconds to go trying to, you know, score those shots. And if he misses, he misses, but I think he's going to hit way more than he misses. And so that's kind of, I guess, you know, we can, uh, if you want to have any closing thoughts or, or, or closing question, we can do that. But I, I think that's overall kind of like where I'm at is that I, I understand where Dave's coming from. I understand where people like you are coming from. And I think we need to have more conversations like this, where there's a good faith, like agreement on the found on, 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 on the foundational principles, a good faith understanding of, how we should deal with public property on the micro level and then start trying to find better solutions as we extrapolate to, to bigger issues. And again, like no one's saying don't try to abolish the welfare state. No one's saying don't try to end the war on drugs. We should always be trying to do all of those things at the same time. I don't think Dave's out there like saying put a hundred percent of the focus on the borders, but I think he is reacting to listen, like the, the public, we need Overton a window, <laughs> the, the Overton window moves around, and right now it's heavily focused on borders. And so, like, it would be kind of weird if, like, while everyone's focused on borders, if he started talking about COVID restrictions again, right? Like, that's not the thing people are talking about right now. So he's trying to, like, D- Dave is always in the business of channeling populism in in the most positive way possible for the movement, and so he's trying to get people to to look at the problems of the border. And he's connecting it to the thing he cares about the most, which is the warfare state the thing I care about the most, too. And he's like, it, like, wouldn't it be better if we were a republic instead of a world empire is his basic point. And I don't I don't think that that's that's bad. I think that's a good thing to get conservatives and and even the, the left wing liberals who are more amenable to our ideas to get to get the Listen, we're just trying to get people into the kiddie pool like we're trying to get their feet wet in the world of, of understanding libertarianism um, and, and not everyone's going to take the, you know, like I, I jumped in the deep end, N- not, a, not everyone's going to, going to do that, especially when Dave is going on these, these big platforms, talking to, to, to people who, who just have different, you know, commitments, different incentive structures that are influencing, influencing them. Um, what I don't hear Dave saying, and like, I, I, I did challenge him a bit on my show. I said, listen, like I don't think you're saying this, but let's just make it clear. What you're not saying is, I want to militarize the border and point guns out and shoot everybody who's trying to cross. It's not what Dave's advocating for. Dave's also not advocating for zero immigrants to come here. He's just saying we should we shouldn't have to be forced to say let them all come in, right? Because it's not this isn't like a natural influx. It's a very artificial influx. And so um, if we go around trying to tell everyone in the United States of America, listen, we know this is a huge artificial influx created by the state. It's going to cause all these problems, but you just have to roll over and accept it. I I think people are going to turn their ears off and not going to listen to anything else we say. That doesn't mean that we should then go to the, you know, shoot them all. We have to find, you know, and this is Dave and I agreed. We need to find, as much as we can, ways to push the state towards solutions that are more humanitarian and that are more peaceful. Uh, maybe it's something like I've said, like maybe open like fifty Ellis Island style checkpoints across the border, right, and funnel people into those, and 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 do your best to have a screening system that's like if you're a if you're a criminal, you're kept out. If you're if it looks like you have nefarious intents, you're kept out by people in. Is that going to be imperfect? Sure, right. But again, like we we gotta have we we have to start talking about what the first step is, and then acknowledge that. Listen, where we are at now, there is no first step that's going to be like perfectly satisfying to us. That first step from like literally almost as bad as it gets is still going to be in in territory. Like my driving analogy before, like if I was if uh you know if if i was in uh germany trying to drive to london uh i'm using european analogies here since you're across the pond um uh every step along the way from from uh from 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 berlin to london is going to be not in london where i want to be and so we have to just acknowledge that that like there there's no one step solution from now from 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 here to Ancapistan, and so 
we're gonna have to hold our nose a little bit and 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 trudge through some statist uh solutions as we try to push for a freer society yeah i understand what you're saying i mean if i could just piggyback on that analogy my con to to kind of illustrate my concern is just that i worry that we take uh too many detours on the way we might end up going in the wrong direction sure because because of it um and but i do understand the sentiment we don't want to let the pursuit of perfection get in the way of progress exactly we don't want to you know like um i mean a, a good example with regards to sort of playing the status game but still trying to you know move it more libertarian as we go i mean things like drug legalizations would be a good example of that i mean there's no I, i'm i don't know all of the details of all the different um legalizations for example like with cannabis that you have in different states in america but obviously different states have different levels of recreational yeah. medical and all the rest of it but none of them are the true libertarian model because the true libertarian model is is mind your own minding your own business and letting people do what they want with cannabis whereas these states have different even the ones where it's legal it's still regulated and restricted in certain ways only certain people can grow it and pr produce it and and obviously you've still got the federal law coming in and and you know and you've got like restrictions and all the rest of it um so you know it's still not the like you say it's still not that perfect libertarian solution but it's it's moving in that direction it's progress it's a you know it's it's an easing of that but i would use that an example of still playing within the status game but still staying true because you're still moving it in that libertarian direction it's not the libertarian yeah. solution but it's more libertarian than cannabis being completely prohibited and criminalized so it's it's better um but the problem is with the border issue is I feel like that's at least with regards to the, the what Dave's proposing is I feel that's more akin to, say, looking at the fentanyl crisis and saying, mm, let's make fentanyl illegal, though, because, you know, that's a bit of a disaster. And, you know, and I could understand how the fear of what's happening with the fentanyl crisis might make some libertarians wince when they think about all drugs um being you know uh legal or, or not criminalized or whatever um, right well, i think what dave says there and, and we'll, we'll have to finish up here in a, in a minute but i, yeah, I think yeah, dave's yeah. point there is well legalizing all drugs is actually just the pure libertarian position so we do kind of have to take that that on but saying that while the state exists we have to have open borders he doesn't think is actually the libertarian position and I, I tend to agree with them. I'm not convinced it is the actual like libertarian position, right? Because like it's because even if you open the borders, well, that's still the state controlling the borders. So it's not actually the libertarian position. So there is no like if you, if you get the government to stop like just completely like, OK, whatever, like there is now just a free market with fentanyl and we're not going to regulate it. We're not going to do anything with it. It's it. it, it you know, it's not the same as the government saying, well, we're still controlling the border, but now we're just letting anyone come and go. Um, yeah, I understand I, what you're I, saying. I, but... I, 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 think it's, I think it's just a, a, uh, a, 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 an incongruity between those examples. But then, and then, and again, I, I understand your concern. We don't want to take too many detours, but I feel like we have to, again, be willing to, like, we, we don't know what we don't know. So we won't know. It's kind of like we're in a maze, right? Like we we don't know what's going to work till we try it, and, and it either works or doesn't work. So, um, I guess like my my final word would be: I just I don't want the fear of making the wrong decision to put us into the spot where we do nothing and just let current events and history unfold before us, and we don't even have like we don't have a hand, we don't even have a finger on the steering wheel yet. Like I'm saying, like let's let's at least try <laughs> to do something, and and we'll see that where the chips fall where they may. But um, but yeah, I do have to I do have to hop off here, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, but this has been a, a really fun conversation. Listen, man, I I understand where you're coming from. Uh, your your heart's in the right place. I think you know more conversations like this are what libertarians need to be having, and you know, kind of the the Bible calls this iron sharpening iron, and and so. Uh, you know, it's a way we can we can sharpen our ideas with by by having this back and forth, and and hopefully, you know, both of uh, both of us and the people listening to this conversation can come away and feel like they've learned something.
Yeah, no, I agree. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to have this conversation. I will wrap it up now. I feel like there's still some meat on the bone of this. So maybe in the future, we could have another conversation sometime and and perhaps revisit some of these com- um, topics, because I still think there's a little bit of meat to chew on. Um, but I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, um, I've really enjoyed the conversation. I think it has added some clarity as well, both for both of us, but also to, hopefully to anyone who's listening. Um, so I really appreciate that. And um, I really appreciate anyone who's listening to this now. Thank you.